yeah, lovely to be here again. I, I think, you know, many of you might be familiar with me by now. Um, we're going to be looking at perinatal mental health tonight, why it's important, who's affected, um, how perinatal mental health services are configured. Uh, we'll be looking at common conditions and treatment um, and some of the red flags as well. Um, always lovely to see a kind of international audience, but I suppose the caveat is when I talk about the services, it's very much a kind of UK perspective. So there will be kind of international variations. Um, so do check that out sort of in the, the region that you're practicing. Um, just a little bit about my experience really of perinatal mental health. Um, working as an ACP, mainly in liaison psychiatry, came into a lot of contact, um, sort of perinatal reviews in my clinical job. Um, I was based at MRI Hospital, which is in Manchester. Um, and if you know the area, you'll know there's quite a big maternity hospital sort of within that complex. So lots and lots of referrals, um, many of them standard, straightforward. But sometimes we did have quite complex, quite unwell women. Uh, so my day job now, I'm a senior lecturer at MMU. Um, and I also do a bit of expert witness stuff for when, you know, things go wrong and civil liability cases. So perinatal just means the period around uh, pregnancy or birth. Um, so typical service users are going to include perhaps those with a serious mental health condition who are planning to get pregnant. Uh, those who develop a serious mental health issue during pregnancy or in the first year following birth um, or who are at risk of having a serious mental health problem during pregnancy. And I think when I say serious, um, we use the terms sometimes interchangeably, SMI and SEMI, which is sev severe and enduring mental illness. So what we mean by that is kind of bipolar schizophrenia, psychosis, severe depression um, and eating disorders. Um, certainly people with personality disorders would also warrant intervention from perinatal mental health services. Uh, there's a massive kind of risk component here, which we'll talk about. And if there's a family history or if you've had a previous episode of mental Um, and it can be gradual or sudden, um, but it can also exist on a spectrum. And it's the kind of moderate to severe ones that we really want to be, be mindful of. This will typically occur in the first year after giving birth. So if you've kind of had this before, that's the, the higher risk period. Although that first 10 weeks, if you've not had it by then, you're probably kind of off the hook. Um, I guess if you're not familiar with the symptoms of kind of major depressive disorder, they are largely the same. So we're thinking about depressed mood itself, irritability, um, anhedonia, which is just a kind of uh, clinical inability to experience pleasure. So if you think about hedonism and, you know, living your life like that, that's where it comes from. A lot of these words are kind of Greek uh, medical words. Um, certainly hopelessness is a significant feature of depression. Um, we'd call these the kind of psychological symptoms. We've got guilt, we've got low self-esteem, and this may or may not be kind of accompanied by suicidal thoughts. I suppose the key difference in the kind of postnatal variant is that sometimes there can be feelings of hostility or indifference or coldness towards the partner or the baby. Um, so that's something that we really need to keep an eye on um, because that can really impact bonding with the newborn. Postnatal depression can be really isolating for women. Um, like I said before, kind of alluded to, you know, I think as a society, we see pregnancy and birth as this really joyful time. It's wonderful. And I think women can feel very much under pressure um, to appear that they are living up to expectations and loving every single minute. Um, but again, it's not all like that, is it? You know, the, 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 there are sleepless nights, there's difficulty, there's broken sleep. Um, you're maybe going to get irritable yourself. Um, so if depressants take a good couple of weeks to work 
uh, whereas antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, a lot quicker. So that's what you're going to be using uh, to manage the immediate kind of safety. As I've mentioned, you know, the Manchester Trust were lucky enough to, to have a mother and baby unit. Um, that really would be the gold star treatment for anyone with a postpartum psychosis. Um, they're operated by specialist staff. They can care for the baby um, if the mother's too kind of unwell and they can really support that mother and baby bonding time. Um, so, that, you know, they've got kind of nursery staff there as well. So really good. And again, I think if you have got a woman that you're worried about or who is worried about her mental health, you know, just make it clear that if the worst comes to the worst and you need a mother and baby unit, we are endeavouring to keep you together. I guess the caveat to that, um, and this is perhaps where we want to avoid over-promising, is that there's only 22 in the UK. I don't know if you can make that out clearly, but we've got a kind of cluster kind of in the northwest, Yorkshire, the Midlands, um, three down in London. I thought there'd be more and only two in Scotland. And again, as I mentioned before, none in Northern Ireland. So really, really tricky. Um, I think, you know, the sad reality is for even general adult psychiatric beds, um, sometimes there's such a shortage uh, with, with vacancies, with beds, that people are having to travel um, hundreds of miles away. And I think the demand for these beds, because there's so few places, that can really spike as well. So it can be tricky because while we keep the mother and the baby together, you're also removing them from other family, you know, whether that's, you know, the grandparents, partner, etc. Um, and then taking that worry on that you've inadvertently, you know, inappropriately touched your own child. This can have a knock-on effect. So there can be excessive washing of toys, bottles, clothes. Uh, you might not clean the baby because you're worried that you're going to, you know, inappropriately sexually touch them. Might be excessive checking on the baby to see if they're still alive and that wakes them up and makes the situation worse. Um, avoiding visitors, avoiding outside, um, you know, due to that fear of contamination. So some of the red flags, and these can occur in any uh, kind of condition. So it's not necessarily just linked to PPP. Um, if you were to notice any of this in um, a woman who's just given birth or just about to give birth, this is really, really something that you have to action. So significant changes in mental state. If you know the patient well, you're in a really good place to, to look to know the baseline and to look for any changes. Any new or kind of violent, new thoughts or acts of violent self-harm or suicide. Take, I mean, we take this seriously anyway, but that Embrace report found that pretty much all of those mothers who killed themselves chose a very violent method, whether that be hanging or jumping in front of trains. And when you look at suicide in women more generally, women tend to choose less violent methods like overdose, um, so less traumatic, whereas it tends to be more men that kind of hang and jump and um, you know jump from buildings. But for whatever reason, the violent thoughts of suicide in this perinatal population tend to be very focused on that. And there's a good link between completion. So take that super seriously. Um, the other ones are put in italics because they can be perhaps downplayed or minimized. But if you've got a woman that you're looking after and she's reporting new and persistent expressions of incompetency or new and persistent feelings of alienation from the baby, it's really important that you dig into that because I think we've always kind of dismissed that as being a normal part of being a mum. You know, oh, you'll get used to it. You'll kind of learn on the job kind of thing. But if it's new, if it's quite far from baseline and it's persistent and not getting better, that could be a sign of psychosis. So you might be working with someone with PPP and not even know it. Um, so I think, excuse me. A resource, best use of medicine in pregnancy. Um, I like to put this in just because it's such a, a hot issue at the moment. 
Sodium valproate, you know, kind of for a long time now has been known to cause birth defects and problems with kind of the baby's development. Um, so there's a national program, uh, Prevent, that if anyone's kind of of childbearing age on valproate, they really need to be on a pregnancy prevention program. Now, if you're not familiar with sodium valproate, um, it's used as a mood stabilizer, but it's also used to treat epilepsy. So if you do work in those kind of fields, uh, just be mindful of that. And it might well be if you're working with a woman, you notice that she's on sodium valproate and she noticed that maybe she's having unprotected sex, for example, it's definitely worth having that conversation. So in summary, take this all very seriously. Perinatal mental illness kills. Have a very low threshold for seeking advice or emergency treatment. Get familiar with those red flags and symptoms of PPP. Research local services before you need them. Break down that stigma. You know, don't kind of push this idea of everyone needs to be super mum. You know, it's okay to not be okay, especially with such a hard job of, you know, looking after a newborn. And share information. You know, it, you might have that piece of the puzzle that shows the woman is on the downward trajectory.